built a, a really nice complex, which you can see be behind me here. Um, so he sold the cows in, the, I believe it was August of 2009 in the CWT buyout. By October, um, we'd reached uh, an agreement and in December we started purchasing heifers. And it all seemed really, really fast at the time. We were milking uh, in, in January. We started out with all springers. And I just have some notes here. By April, we were up to 275. And May, we were probably closer to 375. So it, we, we capped a lot in, in a hurry and started that um, journey, I guess you could say. So today, we're, we're at about 600 mature cows. Just over, I guess you could say. We have 330 heifers at a custom grower in Pennsylvania. Um, just finished this spring converting the barn all to sand. That's been a, a big improvement for us. We have a double 16 here in Bone Parlor. We, we cropped 1,500 acres of land, um, both for feed for our cattle, and we, we sell grains as well, small grains. We do our own tillage and planting, and uh, all the crops are custom harvested. We have 11 full-time and two part-time employees. The, the business structure, as I said, is an LLC between, uh, you can see Bill and John and myself there in that picture. By the way, I, I take no credit for this PowerPoint. That was on my way if I'm not very uh, technologically advanced. But um, So it's a senior partnership between John and Bill, and I'm the junior partner on, on site on the dairy. I own currently own about 20%, and uh, we'll talk about maybe later the plans for me to gain partnership. So the future for us is, is kind of simple. Um, we're just kind of just getting going on this dairy, so we're still uh, in the phase where we're trying to improve on what we're doing um, on the cow side and on the crop side, and we're trying to get better. I'm trying to get better with managing the employees, and uh, I guess we're just in that mode where we're just trying to hold tight and, and do a better job of what we're doing now. Thank you guys for your introductions. Um, so I guess what I'll do is I'll just start it off with a question and then we have microphones and then if people have questions, um, please ask and they will try to help you out. And as you can see, we kind of have a, a good mix of people here. We have Sonia who's working right with her parents, Luke who is two different um, business structures, and then Diesel who's working into a non-family partnership. So my first question for all of you, and kind of just go down the line, is what do you do for communication on a daily basis, monthly basis? And, uh, Chrissy talked about the tactical versus strategic. How do you manage that? Talk about that. OK. Um, our communication during the summer is a little scattered, just kind of the nature of the beast. Everybody's going in 10 different directions. Uh, lately, our family meetings have been around uh, pizza on Friday night when everybody's done with chores. Uh, but during the winter, we try to meet Thursday mornings, and we have an agenda. And, uh, so that's worked pretty well for us. Um, what was the rest of the question? <laughs> oh, the strategic and tactical. Um, the tactical stuff, you know, that's. We try to try to meet at least once a week on all of that. The strategic, we kind of leave more for the winter or when we're not busy doing crops or showing cows or going to tractor pulls or conventions or whatever the deal is. So um, we started developing the LLC through January through about April 15th, and then we're planning on having another strategic meeting this fall, probably around September 15th, and. Uh, kicking into gear this fall. So. so in my situation, um, communication is certainly something that's lacking, um, and that's probably a big reason why we have two separate businesses. Um, we couldn't we couldn't effectively communicate um, to work to work together. Um, had two different goals and and, and visions. Um, so the majority of our communication is basically getting forages put in and, and quality forages, um, and then we do meet. We do so we try to meet sometime in, in the winter to 
discuss forage needs um, for the coming year and, and what our strategies are going to be to do that, start dates, so, so on and so forth. Um, weather was definitely challenging this year, um, but we don't communicate here as much as we probably should on a week, weekly basis. Um, my dad is still pretty involved with with day-to-day -day stuff. I can't can't seem to get rid of him. Um, Do you use a moderator at all? Um, yeah, so my cousin Russ Seville, who is also our nutritionist at Cargill, um, helps helps us to uh, to come up with strategies and, and, and moderate and and have, having a third party there is, is huge to uh, to be able to get stuff done. So um, when we first started out, there's a lot of a lot of communication back and forth, and I think uh, as we've all all grown our roles, it's probably come sometimes less than what it should be. Um, we try to communicate at least once a week. My partners are up if not every week, every other week, and that, that's for John and, and Bill maybe once a month. Um, they're, they're extremely busy as well, so it's, it's, it's not their fault. They're just very, uh, very involved with different projects. So when it comes down to the ta tactical side of things, I guess that's pretty much, uh, maybe they don't want to get bogged down with that at times, so they, and, uh, they give me that responsibility. But the, the big picture stuff, we do try to talk as often as we can, and, and definitely before there's any major decision made, I, I always call them and get their opinion and, and their insight on, on what I should do, because uh, my partners are very good at explaining things, so it, it helps me uh, rationalize their thought pattern and uh, probably makes a better decision for me in the end. So I guess that's kind of how we operate things. Group. Questions? Got one for the next. I've actually got a question for each uh, panel member. Um, Sonia, you uh, came back to the family farm, but you went somewhere else for two years. But would you just talk about that experience and reasoning? Uh, I wasn't ready to go home after I graduated from college. Uh, there was, you know, I worked on my parents' farm through high school. I had my daily chores and, and so on. And I felt like after college, I was still in that position of being the child with chores to do at both ends of the day. Um, the opportunity came for me to go to Conan Acres. I went up and visited, fell in love with the place, and moved there in the fall. And it was a great experience. I got to work with outstanding cows and a great family that was multi-generational. Um, so, and I think when I came home, I was better prepared to come into a herd manager position. And my parents were better prepared to acknowledge me in that position. Um, when I came home, my dad basically stopped milking cows, stopped treating cows. Um, breeding decisions became entirely mine. And so a lot of the herd management stuff, he was very happy to turn over. And he, he enjoys doing the crops and machine work. So I think he was really happy to have me come home. And he also felt like I was very capable to fall into that position. Great, I think it was a great decision. Um, Luke, uh, you doubled the herd in two short years. Where do you see yourself in five or 10 years? Do you, do you see yourself looking to seize an opportunity if the right bigger farm come up for sale or do you hope to stay right there? Um, so my, my opinion at this point is that to, to try to continue where I am, um, Get the cows paid off, buy a farm, build barns, everything like that to, to continue to grow and stay profitable. It's going to be ex extremely difficult. Um, I, I'm in, in the grand scheme of things, I'm an extremely low equity 
small net worth business. Um, to, to do that on my own, I, th I think is going to be a struggle. And at the end of my career, I'll have a farm that's paid for. But it, if I'm fortunate, um, so I I think probably long term, um, I would prefer to find another farm out there that doesn't have another generation or would like to have another another partner involved. Um, to, to put my assets into and, and to continue to grow grow something that's already already more well established. Oh, that's great! I actually uh, was going to challenge you that you have two things that the the, the baby boomers don't have, and that is unbelievable uh, youth and energy, and uh, also a broader a broader understanding of, uh, of a lot of the world today compared to how simple the world was for us old folks 20 or 30 years ago. So, uh, Diesel, I really think it's great what you guys have done and that you've gone and struck this out on your own. Um, two or two and a half miles, or excuse me, two or two and a half hours between the farms, right? Do you share any resources? Uh, you know, that's the one tricky thing. If you're 20 minutes apart, you could share resources. Do you share resources? And then also, is it communicating back and forth mostly on the phone? Do you use emails? Um, I'm curious about how you communicate with, with the guys with a little more experience that are your partners. Yeah, we we share some stuff. We we jointly own a drag line system. We found out pretty early on it is it can be a challenge to share equipment back and forth that far away. Um, but that's one of the things we, we do use back and forth. Uh, we, we try to share, we're probably not as good as we should be at sharing ideas back and forth from each dairy. Scipio is here, you know, they were so much farther ahead of us when we got started, so it is, it is tough to, to compare notes when we're not at their level. Um, we try to communicate by phone mostly. Yeah, if there's any documents or anything, we just email it back and forth. But it, it's generally by phone, we, we'll call, and call each other. And, once in a while we'll have a conference call and we have something big. John and Bill do come up though if there's if there's anything that really we need to talk about, big picture agenda stuff, they'll they'll come up and we'll just sit down and talk about it. Um, on a number of the farms it seems like the businesses have done a really good job of creating management positions that are well paid and the guys have a pretty good quality of life and they're doing a great job of kind of keeping things running. <clears throat> but from time to time, if they don't have family members themselves kind of coming along behind them wanting to take on that ownership role, I'm beginning to get the sense that there's some frustration out there that they're challenged by not finding the entrepreneurial people that really want to take that next step and become owners. So what was it really that led each of you to want to own your own deal or have a piece of the action rather than a really good career working for somebody else on, on one of these dairies. I don't know why I get stuck answering first all the time. <laughs> um, so basically, why did I decide to go home instead of finding a really good paying job somewhere else? Um, well, I worked in Maine for two years and I was seven hours away from my family. I have a sister with disabilities um, that needs full-time care. I have seven nieces and nephews, and working on the farm up there, while it was a great experience, I was missing dance recitals and piano recitals, and um, mom was really struggling with finding help for my sister, and I knew eventually that I needed to be in a position where I could help be a care provider. That's something that's important to me. Um, so I knew that I wanted to come back to the area. How did I know I wanted to go home? I really enjoyed working with cows a lot more than I did people. <laughs> and um, I got a phone call one day that my mom called and said, the neighbors just put a for sale sign in front of their house. Are you serious about coming home? Do we need to go talk to them? So that kind of started the whole discussion. And it got to the point, you know, I was working with a really good herd of cows and it was a lot of fun up in Maine. But if I'm gonna work that hard, I'd really like to develop my own cows.
So I I wanted to come home. Um, it was it was where I grew up. Um, it was w what I grew up with. Like I grew up working very closely with the cows, breeding decisions, working with cows, um, and I was very passionate about that group of cows, that farm, family, um, and it was in wanting to own and develop your own sort of thing and and having that control control factor that's i mean it's it's nice to be to have some control and make some decisions um it, but being able to have something that's yours is um, pretty important to me um so i guess i've always just wanted to own a farm i don't know why i did not grow up on a farm um, but I will agree with what Sonia said that at the end of the day, if you're going to work that hard, um, it is kind of nice to have a piece of the pie at the end of it. That being said, I do know friends of mine that do very well working for other people and, and maybe have a profit, profit share or something like that. So it, I think it's just kind of in your makeup. It's it, either you do or you don't, you know, I think that's what it boils down to because some of them are doing, are doing quite well, but they're happy and, and I'm happy for them, but I guess I would rather take the risk and, and want to be an owner at the end of the day. So all of you do some amount of decision making on farm. Um, how did that transition of decision making happen from one generation to the next? And Sonia, you talked about it a little bit. And was there anything outside resources, programs that you took advantage of that helped with those skills. So when I came home in 2008, kind of, I took over, took over the decision making on the the herd end of things. Um, that was before that. My mom was kind of in charge of of the herd management, um, and she was very willing to hand hand that over. Um, but a lot of the things that I wanted to change um, and, and do, I was getting a lot of resistance from from my father, um, who had run a very successful, very profitable small small dairy for 20 years, and he had a way of doing things and wanted to call all the shots. And my mom was kind of okay with that; she just did her thing. Um, and so we butted heads because I wanted, there were some things that he was in charge of that I thought could be done better and needed to change. Um, so we were, there was quite a bit of conflict with that. So his thought was, if you want to want to change those things, then maybe you need to be in charge of the checkbook and have some debt and, and make payments every month and you can do it the way that I did it and you'll have an understanding and you'll have more of an appreciation for for what you want to do. Um, so the herd was transitioned to me as soon as I came home and then after I was home for almost three years, um, I, I took over took over the, the business side of things and basically all the decisions decisions became mine. Um, there was a lot of planning that went into the whole transition. Um, we worked with um, my cousin cousin Russ Seville and um, his coworker at that time, Kathy Wixwa, um, who had just just left uh, Cornell Cooperative Extension and, and took a job with Cargill. Um, she's no longer with us, um, but she was. An amazing help to me. Um, shaped, shaped, shaped the way that I do things now. She was um, helped helped me develop business skills. Um, made sure that I was focused on building that balance sheet, paying down debt. Um, made me made me realize how disciplined I had to be to be able to make it. Um, buying the cows and, and running the business. Um, so the cows was the easy part for me. Uh, the, taking over the business and managing employee, uh, one employee at that time was, was totally new. Um, and it was kind of 
there wasn't a lot of transition of the skill over time. It was basically just put in my lap and and uh, go with it. And you learn, you make some mistakes, but you learn pretty quickly. Um, and and I certainly had guidance from a lot of people around me that that uh, that was very helpful. Um. So when we first started, I had a fair amount on my plate with the cows. So I was more focused on the cows in the beginning. And as we were, we were trying to train, change the culture a little bit of the dairy that was there, we, we maintained four of the employees. And we were just trying to get things transitioned in the way uh, we wanted them done, which is sometimes not always the easiest thing. So I guess it was a gradual transition for me. I felt like I had enough on my plate and probably as I became comfortable with that, John and Bill challenged me in the next step, and it, it just kind of evolved into, into what it is today. Um, that being said, I don't know if there's, I think all three of us kind of think alike, and uh, so probably my decision would, would probably be their decision too. Maybe that's just because they trained me right, but, um, so it, it seems to be fairly a seamless transition, I guess you could say. Um, as far as it, like continuing programs and education, I was, is it the Academy for Dairy Executive? Is that sort of, so I went to that probably two years ago now, and that was, I got really exposed to different personality types and the way different personalities and generations think, and that was very beneficial to me. I feel like I've become a lot better at managing employees since then, so that's, one of the things I, I guess I did, and I'm thankful I did it. Well, being as small as we are, um, there's not a whole lot of employees to manage. Our summer intern, that, that's my project, I guess you could call it. We've had three, and it's been a great experience for both us and the interns. Um, and as far as the day-to-day -day stuff, that was almost immediate when I came home. Like I said, my dad, uh, his cows, the cows really aren't his passion, the machine work is what he's really into. And he made the comment not too long ago, somebody asked him, you know, since, since Honey came home, have you done less work, have you started working less? He said, no, I'm working harder than ever. But you know, I'm enjoying my work more than ever. Um, so that was kind of an interesting comment. And I think we're, it's kind of fun having my mom, dad, and myself in this together because we all have the same focus. And we know that if we each do our part, that hopefully we'll meet the end goal. Yes, my question is uh, kind of two parts. The first, to congratulate you, three young people, and then I'd have to ask assistance as to what group, age group, or they were all in the front row. Did they all raise their hand? Diesel, did, did you raise your hand at the same time these two did? That's not their question. Yes or no? Yes. Okay, that's wonderful. Now, that's where I put you, generation, generation one. So what we're, we're getting, a, a, we are privileged today to see you guys. It's, it's exciting. And you notice that I did not raise my hand at all for the first generation that was listed, see? So, uh, <laughs> the other thing is that now uh, you folks, uh, are working with your parents, and I just want to uh, tell the young man in the middle that you know that it's pretty common <laughs> what you're going through, and all will survive. <laughs> it's a, a known fact that all will. Now I'm going to ask you two things. Uh, first of all, you guys are starting to face the age when you've got to face the credit managers. Uh, if you're going to expand, you're going to have to go to some of the people that are sitting in this room or in one of the tents here and sit down eye to eye if you want to expand or something in that sort. And then, like, for instance, how are you dealing with the milk companies? Does your father still take care of the milk hauling and the pricing? That's very. It's, it's important that you're highly involved in, in getting the best price for your own milk and your co-op. I just wanted to know how you handle that. So if so I got two, how two how questions. How do you manage relationships with lenders and milk co-ops? 
So when I originally, when I first bought the cows, um, my father held one note um, on the equipment, um, and he co-signed on the other loan with farm credit. Um, when I wanted to start buying cows again um, to, to, con to continue to grow the herd, um, the first time I wanted to buy just a few cows, he was okay co-signing on everything that I had paid down. Because I started in 2011, we had great milk prices. I was making double or triple payments every month to just knock down debt. So he was pretty comfortable making that, uh, extending what I, basically what I had paid down, he was okay with me reborrowing and remaining as a cosign. Um, this past winter when I wanted to buy cows again, he uh, told me I was nuts and he wanted no part of cosigning. So I felt, so I went to the lender and felt as though I had a track record, um, did a lot of budgets, worked with Worked with uh, Jason, Jason Garces, and Sandy Buxton, putting putting budgets together, um, and and it just been to the um, Academy for Dairy Executives that Diesel had talked about, um, and and that kind of gets gets your wheels turning, gets you thinking about where you're going, what you're doing, helps you gets you thinking about long term and, and, and what's going on and, and I felt like at that point um, and, and had had a, had a couple speakers um, that, that kind of inspired me to think to, to, to move forward um, so at that point I went to the bank and, and told felt, felt as though I had a track record um, had, had a plan in place um, and and they were they were willing to more than willing to loan me the money. Um, the interest rate wasn't quite as good because I didn't have the benefits of, of my father's balance sheet, um, but, but they were willing to loan the money to move forward. Um, as far as dealing with milk co-ops, uh, that's been my call. Um, so I started out with uh, Stewart's Processing, um, which is just a local, local place, which was at that point in time, I felt was hands down the best market. For, for our area, um, we were it was cheap cheap hauling because it was close. Um, really good premiums, good quality premiums, um, and we were still able to use RBST, um, which which for as a per purchase feed operation for me and, and the feed efficiency that that brings was was huge. Um, I think it was summer of 2012. They wanted us all to sign affidavits um, to stop using it, and I wasn't happy about it. So I seeked out, as, did as much homework as I could to figure out if there was some place to go where we could use it, because there was no way I was going to sign an affidavit and continue to use it. Um, so uh, my uncles have a 200 cow dairy that's not not too far away. Um, and they, they did not want to go off it as well. So we kind of tried to market our milk together um, and ended up going to what many would call a shady milk market, uh, Midland Farms, out of uh, Manance, New York. Um, we, we negotiated a, a pretty good pay price. Um, we're, we're able to continue to use, use BSD um, and, and it was, on paper, it was the best deal we could find. Um, there was some headaches. We waited, waited for a lot of checks. Um, had one check bounce, um, but at at the end of the day, the the amount of money that that Oslac makes makes me, and uh, and the quality premiums that they were that they gave us, and, and everything else, it was it was really hard to deal with it, but. The cash flow, you, you have to you have to be able to very well manage your cash flow because it's extremely difficult to deal with waiting for the checks. But so that was all of you. Th that was all my decision. Okay. My dad was not in favor of it. He thought it was a poor decision. But so I've been with him for a year and a half now, and 
it's it's been the right decision for me to go on a, this, I'm on a slim margin purchasing feed and it's it would be very difficult to manage manage cows and manage the checkbook without without the extra income. So how about you diesel? With the other farm involved as well? Yeah, so with the other farm involved we um we're with Dairy Lee there and, and I guess we just kinda rolled in the new expansion. Uh, so we're, we're just, there's a chance we're going to be exploring some options in the future. But as so right now, on the lending side, do you, as far as the, the lending decisions or communicating with the lender on Winsong matters, do you do that communication or does that mainly fall to John and Phil? Um, I am involved in it, yep. As far as, I, always, I don't, I don't ever just call the bank and say, hey, I need to borrow money. I always talk to somebody first, but at the end of the day, I guess they, they trusted me to you know make the decision so I, i'll call them up and, and certainly I, I deal with the lender on a, on a big picture basis as far as you know hey we need we did another note um i'm i'm kind of working my way into that now i've always been in contact and had access to the to our front credit officer but i guess uh, i had enough on my plate that i'm you know, just kind of starting to get to that stuff now so sonia not really. <laughs> okay. I haven't had anything. I haven't had much to do with lending. I have. We haven't met all together with uh, farm credit. And my dad is the secretary on the local bank co-op, but he doesn't type on a computer. So mom or I type his notes for him. So we keep up to date that way. Okay, so we have time for like one more question. I think what I'd like to add is not necessarily a question, and I need to make sure I'm not in front of the speaker to have any challenges here, is um, think about the things that you've heard from this group of three very progressive Gen Yers. Each of them just shared some of the different skills that they've already obtained at a very young age. But probably one of the challenges that they'll have, and maybe one of the things that they heard today, is simply that there's some skills we still need to learn. And that'll be part of the journey, right? Okay? And that's one of the things that, as we think about the differences in generations, and I go back to that, there's a lot of things that we can learn from one another. No different than you typing up an email, right? Okay? It goes both ways. And I go back to the comment that I made, it's about how do we marry those? And how do we take what it is that someone did very successfully and transfer that over so that that legacy can continue? So again, I think I very much commend and, and would um, compliment what Betsy said as well as what others have said is great panel and um, you know, and we need to watch your journey as you continue on and how it is you're gonna carry that legacy moving forward too. Absolutely. So. Just one thing to add, I think that um, all of our panelists come up from a very different viewpoint. They all have done it different ways and are doing it different ways. And it just goes to show that no matter what size you are, no matter um, you know what your demographic is, that there is no one way to make this work. But the thing is, you have to make it work, as Christy said, to carry on your legacy. Just want to make one additional comment. Um, both Luke and Diesel mentioned the Academy for Dairy Executives. Yes, that is a program that we put on um, with Pro Dairy, And it's a, kind of a traveling program across New York State. And this year, uh, the program will begin in November and it'll be in the central New York region. So it'll be three different locations. Um, if there's information in the back about that program and for young people who are working into management, it definitely is a good program to kind of get you exposed to a lot of different topics as far as farm management goes. I'd like to say thank you to our panelists and to Christy for coming out from Wisconsin. She's going to stay here and enjoy our safe and vacation for a few days. So uh, thank you all for coming. And I think I'll turn it back over to Joel. Do you want to do lunch first? Or... We've got a message from the American Dairy Association. And uh, we're going to hear a little bit about how our checkoff dollars are being invested in improving our markets. So we're going to have a word from Mary Burgett, who's from uh, Tully, a former dairy princess, who's working with uh, ADA and ECNY, I think. 
and uh, then we'll move into the lunch break. But Mary, thank you for being with us, and tell us what's going on in the milk parking business.